when I was doing some background reading, I was knowing that we've got the two firms, we've just talked about complementary styles. Um, that also means that there's a, there's a difference in approach and a difference in philosophy. Where would, how would you two see the divergence and the similarities between the way that, that you invest? My take was like more of a value, folk, like a deeper value contrarian focus from Platinum and Hamish from the, the, the recordings and the reading I've done recently. I, I feel like I'm getting a sense that the, the quality of the, the business and the hurdles for the, that growth trajectory that the business are on is, is a bit more paramount in your process. Yeah, we, 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 we won't do sort of contrarian deep value type, type, type investing. Um, we, we tend to invest in super high quality. We do take, within that, we will take a contrarian position. And often your best ideas are contrarian, but they're not classically, would be styled as sort of the contrarian um, uh, play. So I, I think that's slightly different. I think uh, Platinum's more diversified in, in terms of the number of holdings. We tend to take very concentrated, single stock, specific type, type risk. Yep. And well, I think Platinum takes less of that single stock type risk, they don't end up with 7% of the portfolio in a single name. Right. So that, that so the absolute concentration uh, is different. We have obviously got expertise and things in, in different. We've been more US centric, they've been more Asian centric um, in, their, in, in, in their portfolios. I think they're, they're probably, they'll be more classically in the value bent yeah. in terms, but everything comes to value. So I, I find this yeah. misnomer about, they're probably <laughs> more contrarian in the yeah. style than, than we're all looking at value at the end yes. of the day. So this, this concept of value investing is, well, is something that just takes itself to one or the other. It's stupid. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm more and more object to the, the label of value because if you're not a value investor, then you're not investing. You're actually just speculating, right? Because, I mean, everything comes to us. Everything comes down to price. But, you know, value gets associated with low PEs, low price to book. And, and you could have a low PE and a low price to book and be terrible value. Or you can actually, you know, be a very highly rated stock, and we think represent great value. And I think the exactly thing we, when we bought Visa and Mastercard, they were at fifteen times earnings or something, and we thought they were dirt, dirt cheap. Yep. But uh, but the deep the value investors say, well, they're not at a, they're never going to be low price to book because they don't have any, have any books. Book. So. But 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 they're they're good examples. I mean, we we at the time were doing the work on those because they were at the time you were buying them. They're out of favour because some of the regulatory changes going through. So we do like to have that present, that sense that, you know, there's something pe concerning people about the company. But we do end up from time to time in the same stock. So I think we were both in eBay and then PayPal as it spun out. And I think you both own Facebook at the moment. And, you know, we, we've come to Facebook, like we were watching it very closely for a long time and then, you know, hadn't acted on it and we had the Cambridge Analytica initial sell off and bought it then and then have bought it again after the sort of reset on But it's earnings, interesting, but when we first got into Facebook was, was probably a year and a half earlier than that when they gave a warning about that they were going to have less ad load and the market sold off dramatically. Yep. And we went, so ours was a bit of a contrarian entry point. Yep. Platinum just came to a contrarian point. It was another con contrarian yes, but, entry point as well. But I, think, but I think, you know, we do end up in some of the same stocks some of the time, but we probably just are prepared to go be uh, what we would talk in terms of quality. So we're prepared to go down to more cyclical sort of where stocks. We, where we won't. We, we're just very strict on the quality that yep. we won't. Yeah. And we're not saying what she's right or wrong. It's just a, a, a style. And, and, and it goes a bit to our sort of lesser concentration because we always sort of look at people who run very concentrated portfolios and for us we'd say, you know, sometimes those strongest ideas are actually our worst, right? Because you didn't, you didn't identify what, if you could have such a strong view on it, you haven't identified what's making you uncomfortable. And for us, we feel like you've got the good calls or the ones that are very uncomfortable, not the ones that are easily done. So, you know, we do prefer to have that sort of uh, broader spectrum of stocks. Having said that, you know, it's still a relatively concentrated portfolio by many people's standards. But yeah, but that, the, the nature of the cyclicality of the businesses that you own you, you need that bit of di diversification just to cushion the ones that don't work out, is that right? I, I, I think that you just don't have the high, you know, when you, you're investing at the very high quality end of the spectrum, you can have greater certainty about the future outcomes. Um, but, you know, it, it's not for us, at the moment we own quite a lot of cyclical type businesses because that's where the market we think is throwing up the great opportunities. 
But, you know, there have been other times where we've been, you know, completely at the other end of the spectrum, depending on what's going on in, on in markets and in the world. Well, talking of markets and the world, the, you know, there's the, the annual, you know, Christmas comes, people take a bit of a breather, but it was also quite a, um, an interesting time with the Fed effectively doing a, an about turn on their, on their policy and, and the narrative around that. People um, in, the, in the latter part of last year were factoring in continued steady rate hikes and they, and they did an about face. How meaningful has that, has that change in stance been for things like confidence and how you're, you're sort of viewing the trajectory for, for equities from here? Um, Amy Schultz, you can start with that. And we'll, Andrew, you've come, come on in. Well, James, you're absolutely right. It was a massive backflip by, by the Fed at the end of uh, uh, January. And I, I don't think many people were expecting the extent of the backflip. Obviously, in the very latter part of uh, last year, financial conditions did tighten, but we had a big sell-off in markets as well. Uh, I, I actually think Davos probably influenced uh, with Dalio and others in, in, in Davos saying that they're, um, you know, they're going too fast, they need to slow down, they're going to cause another recession, we're very worried about how late cycle we are. Of course, we have Trump who, who, who's out there calling on the, on the Fed. And then they come out, you're not only right, they backflipped in terms of somebody inserting the word patient. And that was last used back in early 2016. Mm -hmm. So this feels to me like 2016. They started tightening rates in December 15. And then at the beginning of 16, they got spooked by China, really about their foreign currency reserves. And they put any rate increases on pause for a period of time. And the markets took that as a signal that low rates are here and, and, and 2016 happened. So it eerily feels like 2016 um, again. But very importantly, they also mentioned the balance sheet. They haven't told us what they're going to do, but they said it's, they may well change the pace of quantitative tightening yeah. and ended earlier than previously was being anticipated. And I think that's far more material in the, in the news. So really the punch bowl's been handed back to the markets and we've actually seen, if you look at flows around the world, flows into EMs, flows into high yield and probably riskier areas of the market, there's been a very risk on trade as in this party's gonna continue. You know, my, my sort of warning to people here is none of us know what's gonna happen. Siri, they've probably given us another six months before really knowing where, 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 where it goes from here. Um, are we going to continue this very low inflation world and then the Fed just can continue this pause effectively on without, without having to worry about inflation? I don't know. At the end of the day, we haven't really seen inflation yet, but that doesn't mean it won't, won't, won't happen. It kind of reminds me back of July 2007, uh, this environment. And the reason I'm picking July is because that when, that's when Chuck Prince, who is the CEO of Citigroup, made his very famous... Uh, statement. He goes, you know, when the music's still playing, you've got to get up and dance, and we're still dancing. And, and, <laughs> and at the way, what Powell has done is actually said the music's still playing. Yeah. I, I just think it's very risky to say then it's compulsory to dance. Right. You, yeah. you know, I, I think it's incredibly uncertain. So it doesn't surprise me that the markets have reacted since January and into February as they uh, that, as a have. It looks some of this trade dispute may well get taken off the table. We don't know. Um, uh, China seems to have steadied its situation somewhat, and the Fed has said the punch bowl is back, is back and risk is back on. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd agree with most of, w w w with all that uh, Hamish is saying, but I think the thing that's getting missed here all the time in all this analysis is we're focusing on US rates, we're focusing on the US economy, it's what we've done for the last 30 years. But China today, second largest economy, but it's the biggest market in any physical good you can think of, from shoes to planes to trains. It's a huge market. So it is just, I think, very similar to 2016 in the sense that China had a, a huge tightening of monetary policy back then caused by the capital outflows. What we saw a year ago was this financial reform, uh, a huge tightening of the availability of money, and you can see it in Chinese interest rates. So, I mean, if I ask someone, where's the Chinese 10-year bond? Who's going to tell me, right? Or, or short rates. But Chinese bonds had gone from uh, the 10 year, had, uh, yields had risen from, you know, a bit below three to around four and a half a year ago. And short rates had similarly gone um, above five. So we'd actually inverted the yield curve in China. Now, they don't manage their monetary policy really in that fashion. It really reflects other thing that's, things that are going on. But here we had, um, 
an inverted yield curve in this economy, and guess what happened? It slowed, and it slowed in a way, in quite a different way to what we've seen before, because it's been a much more of a consumer-focused slowdown as um, some of that uh, credit that was finding its way into that market, particularly through peer-to-peer -peer lending, was taken away. Um, so what have we got now? 10-year uh, yields in China are back down around three. Uh, short rates are below three. Um, and we've got a fiscal, uh, again in China, one of the problems is transparency. But all of the policies, the best analysis that's out there suggests that you know, we once again have a fiscal stimulus to the tune of about 3%. Uh, this time more through tax cuts than spending. You know, I, I think the place, you know, we never, we never do know what's going to come next, but in the, the way the systems of the world work, you'd expect China's going to look a little bit better this year. We've taken away the US tightening, um, but again, we are late cycle in the US, perhaps not so much in the rest of the world. You know, it's an interesting sort of circumstances we face this year. So, so um, you've got to vote with your feet. Given the changes that have taken place over that 12 month period that you've talked about with Chinese rates, what we talked about happening in the US, have you, have you dialed up the, the exposure in the portfolio? I know when we caught up last year, I think it was sitting around 80% exposure in your portfolio. Have you, have you increased the risk that you're taking? No, what we've really done is change within that portfolio. So as we've, we've had, the, um, had the sell off later in the year, you know, there are some really great stocks, very cheap, particularly in the semiconductor area. And the one I like to highlight, um, you know, we've often talked about Samsung, but, uh, you know, Micron, um, you know, it's one of the three players in DRAM, one of the five players in flash memory. Most incredible science at the heart of this company or these companies. Um, a very, you know, now consolidated market. The same incentives aren't there to invest in capacity in DRAM at least. Um, it's at the centre of every exciting technology from, you know, whether it's Facebook or it's, it's autonomous vehicles and can buy it at book value. And they're promising to buy back a quarter of their stock at, at the lows. Now, the stocks have had a good bounce off there, but, you know, it was extraordinary value in uh, a lot of these cyclical tech areas. So what we were doing is more going, okay, well, you know, we've been progressively leaving... Um, you know, positions in, in other parts of tech, which we think not particularly expensive, but, you know, didn't offer that same sort of opportunity. So whether that was Alibaba in China, or we've, um, you know, been selling down and, and are out of PayPal, um, which, you know, we still think they're great companies and they have lots of opportunities, but we thought this, you know, represented a lot more. So, you know, the, the market exposure is similar to what we had, uh, a little bit lower than that 80% at the moment. Um, but, but a lot of movements underlying the surface. Hamish, similar style question for you. The, in that um, period in the last quarter of, of 2018, there was a big drawdown, um, you know, particularly in the, in the US index, and it's, it, it's, it's bounced back. But you were carrying 18% or so cash at, at that time. Um, with that kind of dislocation in the market or, or, or short-term drawdown, did you, did you find some compelling ideas? Were you, were, did you feel pressed to put some money to work given some of the changes we talked about at the macro level as well with rates and, and the punch bowl being served back up? Yeah, at the margin at the, at the, at the end of the day. And why I say it was at the margin, um, there was a whole series of things that, that, that we were looking at. And frankly, January ran very strongly. So we, we are less than, we got up to 20% cash. We are. Uh, we're less than uh, that. We're probably around 16% cash, slightly less than that. So we've we've deployed um, uh, uh, some cash. We're, don't forget, we're super super high quality. We tend to not play the technology cyclicals, for instance. I'm not critical at all, at all but that that that's not in our sort of quality um, uh, filter of what, what what we'd play. But a number of things had sold off very um, uh, dramatically. I'm not going to tell people what we've what we've bought. There has been some trading within the portfolio as we. Um, as we saw um, uh, as well, uh, some things we were buying, then they ran past our price limits where we feel comfortable in this, um, uh, in this market. Yeah. Um, so 16% and cash and Andrew, that relatively, you know, so a bit below 80%, that tells me that um, despite some opportunities coming up at the, at the stock specific level, you're both still relatively 
um, cautious and circumspect about the out outlook for where we are in markets. Is that, is that a fair summation? I, I struggle a bit with like drawing that conclusion from our positioning because to me, the positioning comes about the opportunities in the stocks. Right. So I'm extraordinarily excited about the opportunities in our stocks. Um, and to me, in the world we're in, and I'm talking you know, long term, not the next 12 months, I, I think as a portfolio positioning thing, you want to run through time with cash of probably 15% because opportunities arise and if you don't have cash, you're not going to be able to take advantage of it. So I don't even see that as being particularly, I, I think there's lots of issues that will come out of left field and hurt markets over the next five years. Um, but in the meantime, we're buying the stocks we want to buy, have a few interesting short ideas, um, and it's not a statement about... It's not, it's not reflective of a broader view or a market yeah. level view. No, it, it, generally, it generally isn't. Um, and it's very interesting because most people would take our position as being very cautious on markets. I, I'd actually, if I, if, you know, I don't think a 12 month view on markets is of great value from anyone. And I certainly don't think I have great insight into that, but um, because of the sort of things we're talking about with easy liquidity and whatever, my, my best guess is markets are probably going higher this year until um, you know, the next problem arises. Well, let's talk um, about one of the major differences that, that people um, attribute to the, the two firms, how you position they often see um, Magellan as a, a bit of an, a proxy or exposure to more to US markets and, and platinum with a specialty in Asia. Um, a question's come through from, from some of our readers saying, where do you want to place your bets? Like, you know, US versus Asia. And there's been this period of really strong uh, US lead leadership. More recently, Asian markets had, had, had a challenging time. Um, how do you think about um, that, that country and that, that um, geographic allocation and, and, and where you see the, the opportunities within those different markets? Hamish, the bias towards the states? Well, first of all, I'd say there is just a huge misunderstanding uh, about what we do that is biased in the US. It's domiciled to the United States, without a doubt. 70% of our portfolio is domiciled to the United States. But the vast majority of those businesses are very large multinational businesses. We have very, very little cyclical exposure in the United States where we're taking a US view on the US economy dramatically outperforming. Yep. Actually, we've sold down most of what we'd call our US domestic style uh, exposure in, in the portfolio. You know, we, we've got businesses. The example I often give is, you know, Nestle is a Swiss company and it's got 2% of its sales in Switzerland, but it has nearly 35% of its sales in the United States of America. We don't own Coca-Cola at, uh, at the moment for various reasons, but Coca-Cola is a kind of quintessential American company and it has a bit over 20% of its business coming out of the United States. Mm -hmm. So everyone would say that if you own Coke, that you've got a US bet on, and if you own Nestle, you may have a European bet on. It's just complete nonsense uh, at, at, at the end of the day. Ours, because of the nature of very market leading firms like Google and Facebook and Apple and um, Nestle and others, they, they, they're, they're operating everywhere, as in Visa and MasterCard. Some of them may not have businesses in China, like Visa and MasterCard don't have businesses in China, but then we've got Starbucks, which is a big business that, it, that is 60% of its future growth is probably going to be driven by their Chinese business mm. over the next, uh, over the next uh, uh, decade. So, so in no way are we, sometimes we haven't expressed a view of a particular economic zone where we may be buying banks in a particular area of the world or a more cyclical banker kind of cyclicals or, or other things, uh, some retailers, we may buy domestic retailers because we're taking an economic view, but we've got a very neutral economic view in the portfolio, notwithstanding we've got this big domicile view at the moment. We don't tend to have a lot of what we call economically cyclical things in the portfolio. And that may well be a difference wherever that we, we are uh, at, the, uh, at the moment. But this whole US, non-US, and also this thing that the US market is more expensive than, than other markets around the world. If you look at here, the S&P 500's average price earnings multiple, yes, it looks more expensive. But if you look at the underlying sectors of the market and you compare similar companies in America, we just had Micron, uh, which is a US company, but its P multiple was incredibly low. And they bought that over maybe some other memory businesses yeah. in the world because they decided that US one. They, they sell the memory all around the world. Yeah, so, right. so, so even though 
And Andrew's not mainly taking a US China. view on that. Mainly in China. Yeah, is he's, where and he's not taking a US view on that, yet that's a US yeah. company. He's done it because, and when you look around, some of the big, within sectors, some of the cheaper ones are actually the ones listed in America. It's just the American actually index is far more skewed now to like very large technology, which yep. trade at higher multiples yep. um, yeah. as, yeah. A, I mean, as a whole. Is, is and therefore this whole thing, these commentators about mar markets simply are just not that inefficient. Uh, this is absolutely correct. So I, I think we've missed, um, it is, we've always thought the way you want to look at the world is, and it's the way our teams are set up, is they're industry specialists and you can't do Micron without knowing Samsung, uh, Hynix, SanDisk, the lot. So you, uh, you can't do Sanofi without knowing what Merck is doing in the US. And this is exactly the case, that the US is expensive because of these large tech stocks. There, there's some differences. I think the US banks are generally a lot more expensive than banks around the world, but you'll get the, but, but then conditions for banks have been much better in, in the US. Although well. I'd actually tell you, if you actually look at the, the, the big US banks and you look at their average price multiples compared to the non-Chinese yep. large banks in the world, the multiples are very, very similar at the moment. They probably are, but if you And if you adjust them for the return on equity, their price to books probably for the right return on equity is probably not that far out. The US was, yeah. they've come I, off quite a bit lately. Yes, so they, yeah, yeah. So I, and I'm not following that closely, but I think some of the, 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 the banks exposed to Eastern Europe, which is a really healthy environment, you know, where we're talking of stocks that are, you know, got growing loan books and on book value and seven times earnings. And, or you can go to somewhere, a distressed economy like Italy and get the great bank in Tessa. Um, and they're paying out all their earnings, you're getting a 10% yield. Now, it's not the most exciting investment because if that's all you're gonna get, I wouldn't own it. You, you need some economic growth to make it a sensible investment. But anyway, they're probably, I'm looking at particular banks rather than the big, you know, yes, the, the large European banks are, are pretty dull, I think, or, or in line. But, but it is this thing, it's not about the geography in most cases. Yes, there'll be domestic US business, domestic Chinese businesses um, that are facing their own factors, but it is really about, you know, we need to be looking at the world on, a, on an industry basis. Uh, and that's why we're global yeah. investors, and true yeah. global investors would look at the world that way. Right. Yeah. So what do you think are some of the, um, the, the really exciting long-term global industries um, you know, that you think have got this, this multi-year growth cycle ahead of them? Where, where are you seeing the really strong tailwinds, the, the really attractive longer-term picture at the moment if we take a, a, you know, a positive view on a particular industry that you think is, um, you know, regardless of the, the economic backdrop, is, is really just going to be a, a major player over the next five or ten years? Well, if, if, I picked, if I picked one big one that, that we're still in very early stages, I'd put cloud computing. Uh, the shift of computing power in the world, and there are going to be very, very few huge infrastructure players in the world with the deep um, capability. So, you, so outside of China, um, we probably have three very large scale players uh, now in the world. Amazon with AWS obviously is one. Number two is sitting in Azure, which is owned by Microsoft, and three in the world is um, um, Google Cloud, obviously owned by, uh, by Alphabet. Um, uh, we're at a very, very early stage, probably in a trillion dollar addressable um, uh, uh, market. If you look over the next decade, that's going to be a massive industry. To get into that, you probably, uh, and of course there's participations in that, and we may hear something on semiconductors and other things, how to participate that, but I think an industry of the future of the shift of computational power to the cloud, and even things like uh, driverless cars and things, that's all going to be powered by ultimately cloud-based te te technology and then you've got the chips and you've got the software and everything that goes into that. So, you know, we've been in some ones that have still got very long tailwinds, we've been payments for a long period of time, there's still this massive shift. You know, global consumption expenditure probably grows at 6%, but these big payment networks are probably growing at around 12, PayPal's a bit faster, but big Visa and MasterCards, because you've still got this massive shift out of payments of cash and check. You know, when you have something delivered online, when is the last time you paid cash on delivery or a check on delivery? It, and all that is, everything that's going on online has to be paid digitally um, uh, now in the world. So that, that is still, even though it's been going on, it's got a very long um, um, a tailwind. But the, the, the big emerging one that I think is just massive in terms of scale, I'd probably put the, 
shift to the cloud. And there's, there's, there's all sorts of different ways. You could be in the software, software as a service, you can be their infrastructure providers, you could probably be in the semiconductor space um, um, uh, could, there. Could you give, give me, I'll come to you in a second, give me an example of, um, you know, often um, people like to say, so what's changing? What's, a, what's a, a new piece of technology? What's being enabled by cloud computing that, that, that really captures your imagination? I imagine you meet with these, these big companies that you're talking about and they're working on projects out the side. Like, what are some of the, the things that you've seen when you've been out researching these companies and understanding their capabilities that have, that have really sort of, blown, sort of blown your mind in terms of, 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 of change with, with how we're going to be living and, and, and interacting in the world? Well, I, I think we're just seeing it in a very simple sense. In sort of, in, 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 in now we're worrying about cyber security and security and everything. These big cloud providers can provide much better security for the future than, than we can provide by investing in our own systems on on premise because they can be automatically patched, for instance. And a lot of these cyber attacks that have happened have attacked from very large companies with on premise software that simply forgot to patch, or it's very, if you operate in 80 countries in the world, it's very, very hard to continuously patch all your different software and everything on the, on the basis. So they're very practical examples, but of course, once you shift of that model and you get software as a service, um, and, and you shift to that, you're then in a very annuity style uh, business. So I think powered by the cloud, you, you, you're gonna see the internet of things, uh, of course, where we're gonna get massive amounts of connected devices all through um, all, all through our homes. Uh, you look at your photos on your phones at the moment, every photo, they're all stored in the cloud. Uh, that, there's very things happening in your life every single day. Ultimately, we'll get to a world, I, I believe, of driverless cars. I think they'll start, they'll start out as taxi fleets. So I think personal driverless cars are a long way out from where we're sitting today. But the shifts there and the impact it's gonna have on, on, on people is gonna be Absolutely immense. We're right at the we're right at the 1.0 of what the shift to the cloud means for business models, and just how we do things in our day-to-day -day lives. Do you get excited by the same change? Oh, look, I, well, I mean, absolutely. The, the sort of cloud is enabling all sorts of interesting things, even within software. So that uh, issue of um, security, for example, you know, interesting company. We don't own it. It's 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 pretty well loved. Zed Scaler, which is using a cloud-based solution to provide security for companies around their existing systems. It's a very, very clever solution. I think it was a, been adopted, it's either Siemens or GE who are, who are using it. So there's these amazing you know, companies coming out of nowhere because of it, um, uh, and you know, quite extraordinary. But there's, there's lots of elements. There's the, to, to, to the excitement that's out there, whether it's artificial intelligence, which autonomous vehicles is probably one of the most interesting elements of that, and even you know, it doesn't have to be fully autonomous, but it's the, you know, what the features you get on a high end BMW or Audi or Merck as they come down, um, you know, through the, the range of vehicles, electric vehicles, um, renewables, uh, you know, lots of interesting things going on there. And then another area is biotech where, you know, we've got some extraordinary science at the moment um, coming up with all sorts of uh, potential solutions uh, for human health and what, what's what an have example you. of a, a step change in that in that part of the, the world? Oh, look, it, it it is honestly, it's you know we've got Bianca Ogden who you know came out of the research labs at J and J, and you know worth an interview on her own to do justice um, to any of those ideas because you know really uh, it's it's one of the areas where lay people really struggle to explain anything well, but you know we've seen. Um, you know, and it's quite a, been a popular idea in the last uh, year or two, but uh, gene editing or whatever, to you know try and you know change people's um, you know response to you know own genetic response and that leads to cancer and disease what have you. And so there's 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 a huge area. There's, so there's all these different things that are, and again, we're the contrarian. But the other thing we love is where there's change going on because to us, it's where you can't extrapolate. Like if you can say oh, uh, here's this company, it's grown at 5% forever and it's going to keep growing at 5% forever. Well, if it does, it's probably the case everyone has a pretty good sense of that. But wherever there's technology and change going on... So, I mean, as an example, um, people are very bearish about the auto companies for a whole range of reasons. Autonomous, the costs of going electric, which is being forced on them by both the European and Chinese regulators. Um, you know, it's been a massive cycle, we're at the end of the cycle, and we probably are. 
But you know, it's when you change products that you create the opportunity for the good companies to make money. So I think there's a very good chance that the boring old car companies, particularly um, a BMW or a Daimler, are going to have make a lot of money out of selling electric vehicles and there becomes the upgrade cycle. Well, you know, I've got my current BMW, but now there's one with, you know, hybrid electric or it's got more autonomous features or whatever. And these are the things that, you know, these kind of changes drive opportunities.